we can accomplish the goals that the Lord has set for us. Man, I'm excited about the word today. It's, uh, how many of you know Satan is a liar? He's a liar and the father of all lies, amen. I, I get confused when men and women of God will receive and, and get taken in by his lies and then all of a sudden they'll make a statement, I'm so confused, I'm so confused about this part of my life and that part of my life and this and that. And if you'll just get in the word and grab a hold of the word that says that God is not the author of confusion, then you'll know where it comes from and you'll begin to cry out to God. You'll begin to rebuke the devil, you'll begin to resist him and he'll flee but instead our society has got us thinking all the negative that we should be negative and we should have negative and everything should come against you but God has given us power to rise above that he's given us the authority to stand against that he has called us as men and women of God to not fall for the rhetoric and the foolishness of Satan and even though we do he loves us anyway but he wants to challenge you today and I'm gonna call it a challenge or maybe maybe some of you is better with a if I dare you and so I'm gonna double dog dare some of you, uh, to just listen to the Word of God, to get the Word of God in your spirit so that you can stand against the enemy. The Bible says to put on the whole armor of God. You can't bit and pieces it. You have to put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. And so when we do that, man, a powerful word will come to you. I don't even have to give it. God's word speaks for itself. God's word settles it. I, I don't have to stand up here necessarily, but praise God, he allows me to. But when you get in the word of God, you don't need someone preaching you that, teaching you that. You need to get in the word of God, ask God to reveal it, ask God that his word be manifested in your life and graft it in your spirit and begin to walk for him, live for him, do for him. Amen. And so I want to challenge you this morning as we head into this message to realize that Satan is a lie, that confusion in your life is not God. You need to cut some things loose. There's going to be some things you're going to have to settle before this message is over if you listen to what this message says. And so this morning, the title of my message is, You Shall Surely Not Die. Isn't that one of the biggest lies that we see early on in Scripture? You shall surely not die. And if you're not familiar with the Word of God, then we're going to run all the way uh, back to Genesis. So you're going to understand that God, in the beginning, God. And for me, that was enough. In the beginning, God. God settled it. God made it. God's doing it. God will always do it. Amen. And so when you understand that God was number one, He was first, and He did all this for you and I, then we understand that the Word of God is true. But I don't want to dance a whole long time on that. I want to get right here to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And so you probably know where we're at now. When you understand that we're in the midst of the garden, you understand that uh, Adam has already been blessed with a, uh, with a helpmate. We understand that God saw the need for, for man absolutely to worship him, to honor him, to bring him glory. He saw that the man could not be alone. Hallelujah. How many men will say amen to that? Hey, I've seen some of you's life. If you get alone, you won't be long, alone long. I, I try to talk to you, and I say, listen, man, listen. Hey, let's put all the hormones down and listen to me for a minute. This is your opportunity to get closer to God. This is your opportunity. Instead of spending those intimate times with somebody you probably shouldn't be with, it's your moment to get intimate with the Lord. And to, Is anybody listening? Well, you didn't listen the last time I told you that. Praise God. We just have to get it in. Okay. And so we find that he, the serpent is the most cunning of any beast of the field that the Lord God had ever made. And he said to the woman, which is Eve, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die or you shall surely not die. And so greatest lie, first greatest lie that we ever hear about, the, the greatest lie that's ever been told, and he's telling it thousands of years later, and we're buying it hook, line, and sinker thousands of years later. And what it is, when that temptation rolls in, the enemy tells you, listen, I know you're tempted, and I know what your preacher said, and I even know what the Word of God says, but you shall surely not die. And so thousands of years later, we haven't learned a thing from this right here as a society, as a 
the people, but instead we're falling for it. He's reeling. He's hooking. And he's reeling. He's destroying families. He's destroying lives. He's destroying your eternity without an understanding of the word or the power of the word of God. And so this morning, with my title being, You Shall Surely Not Die, I'm not speaking as the devil this morning. I'm speaking under the uh, unction of the Holy Spirit because he sent me to tell you, You Shall Surely Not Die. Now, if we were talking about temptations, then I'll give you that one. And we're talking about in the garden. Look right here what it says. You shall surely not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat, it's sitting on the screen, in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You see, that was the challenge. That was what made it so enticing. The, the power sometimes makes it enticing. The position makes it enticing. Us moving up the corporate ladder, or us moving up in society, or we found a, a, a prettier girl or a more handsome man, or we found a, a, a better relationship, or at least it looks like a better relationship. We found, or we begin to look to see if the grass is greener on the other side, and all the while, the devil's saying, go do it, because surely you will not die. He's overriding your conviction. He's overriding the, the, that Jesus is, is pecking on your conscience and trying to get your attention when we live in a society that their conscience has been seared a man has been seared that we don't even know even in the house of God right from wrong anymore we want to use the grace card like he's our spiritual Santa Claus and go live like hell well, I want to tell you something there's I believe that there's a requirement in the word of God that you when you begin to serve him you walk upright there's still holiness in, in this walk with God there's still righteousness in this walk with with God. I believe that he has called us to be separate from the world. We can't talk like the world, act like the world, do like the world when we expect God. How can you expect God to bless your mess that's been dancing in the world, dangling in the world, living like hell in the world, and all of a sudden you want him to bless you? We want, we're asking God uh, as a spiritual Santa Claus to bless our foolishness. To bless our backsliding, to, to, to bless our uh, errors in judgment, to bless those things which we have stepped out, and not by faith by any means, but with the idea that you shall surely not die, go ahead and live how you want to. There's pastors, unfortunately. Preaching contrary to the word of God. False teaching in the house of God these days. That you can do anything you want. Everything's okay. Everything's all right. You can live like hell because there's grace. That's not what the word of God says. Absolutely, there's grace and we'll never understand it. But today I want to talk to you. I want to tell you that you shall surely not die. Now, not in the context that Satan used it, but let's jump backwards for a second. What is the, uh, the uh, serpent reminding her of? What is he questioning her about? We would have to jump back to chapter 2 and verse number 15. It says, Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Isn't that something? That all of a sudden, the truth that's been given from God, by God, is immediately challenged, less than a chapter later, immediately challenged by the enemy. And so why wouldn't it be that on Monday, on Wednesday night, when you leave the house of God after getting a word from God, having an experience with God, that the enemy wouldn't hit you right in the mouth down here when you hit the road and begin to challenge everything you heard, begin to challenge everything and, and after service today? What kind of devil would he be if he didn't challenge you when you get off of this property? Why did I say off of this property? Because we prayed that devil gone off of this property. If he comes in here, then somebody has to invite him. And unless you brought him with you, I didn't invite him. Hallelujah. Listen, and so we see that. And so he's referring back to when God said, listen, if you eat of this, you will surely die. But we have an opportunity. My main goal today is not doom and gloom. My, my main goal is not today to challenge whether you believe in heaven or hell, but to tell you there is a heaven and there is a hell. I, I don't challenge anybody on that. I'm never challenged uh, to debate the Word of God. The Word of God will handle itself. Praise the Lord. When we begin to debate about the Word of God, we will allow doubt to enter in for the rhetoric and the foolishness of those that's debating us. I don't debate the Word of God. I'll be glad to read it to you. 
I'll be glad to share it with you. I'll be glad to give you a word that God has given me. But I, I challenge you today that there's victory because of the cross. We have victory. We don't have to stand under the subjection of the enemy, under the subjection of the, of the rhetoric of this serpent or any other uh, device that the enemy uses because we have knowledge of the word of God. And Jesus said, or the Bible says, that every word that God gives will accomplish that which he has sent it to accomplish. And today, I believe it's going to be an eye-opener. Today, I believe we open our eyes and say, you know what? I've kind of been dancing on the wrong side of things. I've been uh, dabbling over here and dabbling over there. I've been waiting on God when he's been waiting on me. I, I've, been, I've been listening to the foolishness and the rhetoric. I've been uh, listening to that grace card to the point that I feel like I can do anything I want, which is contrary to the word of God. Praise the Lord. I know you're listening. I can hear some of you chewing. It's like Thanksgiving dinner. Hallelujah. The turkey comes out. Everybody gets quiet. I love that. I wasn't talking about me being the turkey. Don't, don't even think about it. Praise the Lord. And so we understand that because of the finished work of Christ, you and I can have victory. You and I don't sit listening to a serpent that can turn our thoughts and change our minds. We don't have to do that anymore. Because of the finished work of Christ, you and I have victory. John 1 and 17, it says, For the Lord, or for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so we find ourselves absolutely standing under, under grace, walking under grace, and it's only by the grace of God that you and I are saved. And the truth of the matter is that Jesus came. How, you can't challenge this part of it. You see, I believe the Word of God. From, uh, from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of Revelation, I believe the Word of God is true. I take it uh, uh, literal. I take it as a challenge, hallelujah, to stand on that, to fight for that if necessary. And no matter what else comes against me, I understand that truth comes through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am. He said, I am. And so the great I am has, has come in into me. He has saved me. He has delivered me. And so with the truth of the fact that Jesus was virgin born, with the truth of the fact that he had three plus years of ministry, with the truth of the fact that he was beat at the whipping post so that every affliction and every sickness and every disease and every cancer and every depression and every anxiety and every heart disease would have to bow at his precious name. The truth of the fact is that he went to Calvary for you you and me, that he died there and declared it is finished and you don't have to stay where you're at anymore. You don't have to live like that anymore to be buried in a borrowed tomb and three days later raised from the dead. And when he ascended into heaven, he said, though I go, I send you a comforter and his name is called the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Listen, there's nothing to be challenged in that. Hallelujah. It's the word of the living God or the living word of the living God. And so we stand on that today with an understanding that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other ransom been paid. There is no other covering or removal of sin. Without the, remi the, without the, uh, the shedding of blood, there would have been no remission for sin. And so with that understanding, it's a shame that we've got to a point that we feel like we can't preach about heaven and hell anymore. We can't preach about that. Somebody asked me recently, you preach about hell very much? I said, no, not very much. I preach a whole lot about heaven. I feel like if they get change their taste buds and want a taste of heaven, they'll quit living like hell. <laughs> but today, God's given us a different word. He tells us in his word that we must be born again. We must be born again. I won't slide in on my mama's coattail. My granny won't be able to reel me in on her apron strings. I must be born again. My relationship with Christ is what settles it for me. Your relationship with Christ is what settles it for you. Granny didn't do it. Paul Paul can't do it. Mom and daddy can't do it. It's time that you stand on your own two feet. Hallelujah. With an understanding of the knowledge of the word of God. And he says in John 3 and 3, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That shouldn't be a shocker. Short of your, uh, uh, short of your raising, being that you can live any way you want to, then maybe you're a little shocked. Short of the fact that you, you've fallen into the, to the story that God loves everybody, and he does. He loves anybody, and he does. He died for everybody, and he did. But you still have to be saved. You still have to repent of your sins and receive that work that he did at Calvary, that work he did at the empty tomb. You have to receive that. He offers it as a gift. 
Now, if I back the truck out here and begin to hand out gifts, and you knew I was handing, I'm telling you, I'm not. Don't look for a truck out by. I'm just saying. If we were offering gifts, and I said, listen, on your way out, there'll be a truck parked under the awning. Please, please take this gift I'm offering you. Until you receive it, it's not yours. It, it, it's not a gift for everybody else. I'm offering it to you. It, it, listen, it, it, this isn't a gift for the ones to your right and your left and your mama and your people and all those people. This is a gift for you. And so when Christ declares this to be the truth, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus, you'll find these people today, by the way. Then Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? We hear that rhetoric. Do you ever hear that rhetoric? People that just want to argue contrary to the word of God. That's the way, unfortunately, uh, a lot of our society is today. They're trying to justify what they're doing. They're trying to justify what they're doing by getting you to buy into what they're doing because misery loves company. Misery loves, it, makes, it eases their conscience when they're doing that thing that is contrary to the word of God. When they're doing that thing and they can roll you in there to do that thing, it sure does make them feel better. Now you both be going to the same hell, but it makes it feel better. It makes them feel better. It makes them feel better about themselves because misery loves company. And so Jesus answered and said, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of the water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. In other words, don't try to figure it out. Don't try to analyze it. Don't get all smarty in here. Just understand that by faith, there's an understanding that until you're saved, until you've had a repentant heart and turned your life around, you have not received the gift which Christ has offered you. You must be born again if you want to see the kingdom of heaven, if you want to see the kingdom of God. I won't debate that, not even going to dance any further in it. But can I tell you today that there is a price to pay for sin? There is a price, there is a, 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 a pay, payday coming. If we choose to live contrary to the word of God. Romans chapter 6 verse number 3. Listen, there's a payday, but there's hope. There's a payday, but there's hope. And so let's look at the payday. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Now aren't you glad God didn't stop right there? Aren't you glad he didn't stop the pen and say, that's it. Just leave it right there. Leave it right there. I want them to know who the boss is. He didn't do that. He says, you have free will. And so I'll tell you the consequences. The consequences of sin is death. The consequences of sin is death. I'm never surprised when I hear about a drug addict overdosing, accidental or otherwise. I'm never surprised by that. But I would be surprised if I heard that a man of God did. That might surprise me. Now, will I be moved with compassion? Absolutely moved with compassion. There's days that the Lord puts on my heart those that are not serving God and those that are lost and undone without Jesus, even in our community, even in our families, even the, the extend, extended family of Life Changers Christian Center, and I am grieved by that. There's days I spend my whole day praying just about that, that God, that you would bring them in. God, that you would draw them in. Heavenly Father, if they are not drawn in, send me to them. I was standing out here in this parking lot last night about 9.30. Praying to the top of my lungs, believing for your kids and your grandkids, believing and standing and fighting and saying, North, give it up, South, send them in, East and West, you must let go. And I, we begin, I, I begin to call on God, the King of glory, to deliver those that are bound by sin, to deliver those that are bound by addiction, to deliver those that are still stuck in their ignorance. Don't misunderstand me. Ignorance is simply the lack of knowledge. So for those that don't have knowledge, God, send them that they receive knowledge. And we begin, we begin to do that. Am I moved by compa with compassion? Absolutely, I'm moved with compassion. He says the wages of sin is death. And so short of giving your heart to God, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. Short of repenting and turning your life, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. But look here, there's hope. There's hope. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the gift of God. I love when they put a butt in there, don't you? I love when they put a butt in there. I love that he says the wages of sin is death, but. In other words, that you've got an option. 
He's given you free will today. You can choose death or you can choose life. I choose life. I choose life. I've made up my mind 29 years ago, honey, that I'm going to choose life. I'm going to be in heaven one day. I'm going to see my love. I'm going to see your loved ones one day. I want to see you one day. But more than anything, I want to see sweet Jesus. I want to see Jesus. I want to worship at his feet. I want to worship at his throne. I look forward to that day. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't want to go tomorrow. I, I, I'm kind of that guy that wants to see Jesus come. I, I want to be here, and I pray that you're here. I, if you're saved, I want you to see this. I want you to understand this, that he's coming again, and no one knows the day or the hour. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be when I'm 106. But either way, I want to be here. I want to see it when it happens. That's my desire. My desire. Why do we preach? What we, because I want to see that. I want to enter into his presence that way. I want to find him that way. I want him to find me faithful. That he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want him to find you faithful. I want him to find you. I want him to find you faithful. I want him to find you faithful. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And so we look right here at John 3.16, and that should settle it for us, I would think. John 3.16 sums it up, makes it easy, and you've seen it in every arena and every stadium in the world. They make a poster board, a banner, or whatever it is. It's probably the most popular scripture, even to those who know no scripture. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, whoever will believe in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we have an opportunity to choose life. He settled it already. His part is done. His part was perfect. So we have to walk in that. We have to step into that. We have to make up our mind today or one day or last week or 40 years ago. There was a time when you made up your mind what side you're going to be on. Well, what team you're going to play for. You had to choose sides. I don't know if you look at it that way, but that's what you choose sides. You make up your mind if you're going to deal with the wages of sin as death or you're going to choose the gift of God uh, of, from God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I heard a story about one of the early printings of the Word of God. It was one of the few printing presses in England, was my understanding. And as that printing press uh, owner was printing Bibles out, his daughter's chore in the evenings was to go to sweep up the printing shop. And he had been printing Bibles and printing Bibles and printing Bibles, and she's sweeping up the shop. And you can imagine back then, man, probably a, a, it wasn't a Swiffer guarantee. No Swiffers. But she was sweeping up, and there was just a little torn piece of paper laying there. She picked up that little torn piece of paper, and she went running upstairs. Mama, Mama, look. Mama, look. Look. I'm so excited. She grabbed that piece of paper, and look. She said, it's just a torn piece of paper, but, what's it, but read it. Read, it, read what does it says. And she said, for God so loved the world that he gave. And she's looking. She said, honey, it just says, for God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? She said, it don't matter, Mommy. The fact that God loved me enough to give anything, the fact that God loved me enough to give anything gets me excited. But the fact that, oh, hallelujah, the fact that he gave his only begotten son that you and I can call on the name of Jesus and find repentance, find a Jesus that loves us enough in spite of our junk. It says that in, while we were yet sinners, in our nastiest of the nasty, at our worst of the worst, in your worst day, your worst sinning day, he saw you there, and at your worst, God still offered you his best. At your worst, Christ was still willing to die for you. Hallelujah. And so we come today with the title, something like, Surely You Will Not Die. Surely You Shall Not Die. And I want to read a scripture to you, and this is my final scripture. But I want to challenge you today to receive this word. As we finish up, as this last scripture is read, listen to the Lord today. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Isn't that something? That we're challenged by death at every turn. On the interstate, maybe on the, at the intersection. Maybe when your heart begins to palpitate and your blood pressure is out of normal and you begin to sweat, just big sweat beads and you don't understand and we're challenged to understand death or not. Fear rips our heart sometimes as we wonder what's going on inside of us. Anxiety builds that pressure and that fear. But the fact is this. The fact is this. Though you die, you will live. I love to preach funerals for people that have 
uh, been had given their heart to the Lord, who have followed the leadership of the Holy Spirit, even followed the Word of God in their life and in their lifestyle. Not that I love that they're gone, but I love to preach those funerals because I know and I have an assurance that they're in heaven. In verse number 26, it says, Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And so maybe my question before I read the title again is, do you believe this? Can you believe that there was a Jesus virgin born? That's tough enough to believe, isn't it? But the fact is this, nine months later, he was. The fact is this, he was perfect. The fact is this, he never sinned, never even had sin. Was he tempted? Absolutely. With everything you're tempted with, my Jesus was tempted at those areas. But what I love about it, he promises in his word that though temptation comes, he promises in his word he'll offer you a way out. There's always a way out. We have people come to us and they're tired and they're weary and they're overworked and underpaid or overworked and overpaid or whatever. And they'll come to us and say, and this is a statement, by the time we're finished with our conversation, they really didn't need us. They just needed to talk to themselves. And they'll say, really what it boils down to, I need to learn to say no. That's your out. That's your out. I, I, I don't need to sleep with her. I don't need to sleep with him. I, I, I don't need to do that. If it doesn't line up with God's word or if it's contrary to God's word, your way out is to say no. Put your big boy pants on. How about that? Be a man. Be the man God called you to be. Be the woman God called you to be. Be the, be the creature that God called you to be. A new creation that he called you to be. I believe he gives us a vocabulary. And a vocabulary is simply this. A two-letter word of no. Satan, no. I choose Christ today. And I choose Christ tomorrow. When I wake up in the morning, I'll choose to honor my wife with the way I live. I'll choose to honor my church with the way that I live. I'll choose to present myself that Christ would be pleased with my actions, with my doings, with my comings, and my goings. And so it's up to me. Tomorrow, whether you choose yes or not, and I choose no, and I choose no, and you choose yes, well, no matter how it is, you'll answer for you one day. You'll answer for you one day in the second part. Let me read the first. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me. Do you believe in him? Do you believe in him? Believe right there means you accept the gospel. You accept what he did for you. That's believing in him. I accept what he did for me. And if you accept what he did for you today with a repentant heart, all you had to do was nod yes, and he heard your heart. He saw your heart. The repentant heart. Listen, a million tears on this carpet won't save you, but a repentant heart will save you. A repentant heart that Jesus sees your... Oh. But look, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And so I believe in him. So what's that mean for me? But let's look at the first part. Whoever lives in me shall never die. What your doings look like. What your comings and goings look like. I, I, I'm not asking for perfection. I'm not even talking about perfection. Are they progressive? Are you walking closer to God today than you were yesterday? Have you chose God uh, t tomorrow uh, and, and walked in that? Or are you living according to the Word of God? Uh, he's, he's looking for progression. I believe he's looking for a heart that says, God, whatever you need to do with me. God, listen, I, I need you. As my Lord and Savior, I invite you in, and, and a heart change takes place. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, that when you have a heart change, you'll have a life change. I believe once you get him, you'll never want to lose him. And if you ever lose him, I'll, ch I'll question whether you ever had him. The Bible says to taste and see that I am good. He is good. You'll not find anything better. You'll not find anything greater. You'll not find anything more satisfying, more loving, more pleasing. Amen. No more faithful. And so I'm wondering why would you trade him for? If you can't find any of those things in anyone else, why would you trade him out? Why would you not receive that gift that he's offering you today? I love this part when it says, He who lives in me shall never die. And he who believes in me shall never die. He who lives and believes in me shall never die. How awesome is that? Can I share something with you? This old body may give up. This old body may give up. My lungs may lo no longer breathe oxygen. But I'm never going to die. I truly believe, according to the Word of God, that my last breath here will be my first breath there. I believe as if you have loved ones there, that you want to be there. You want to go there. You believe, and as you stood there by their bedside, you knew that you knew that you knew down deep in your knower 
that they were ready to go. And their last breath here became peace because of their next breath there. I want to my family to feel that comfort when I go. I want my family to know that that, is, that assurance is, is here when I go. Don't you want them to know? Don't you want to do that? And so today, based on this scripture, I want to declare a words that the enemy used to deceive. I want to declare today and speak over your life that if you will live and believe in him, surely you shall surely not die. You see, the enemy come up with that phrase early on. He used it for deception. He used it to change the world, really. He used it to change the world. But I'm telling you today, if you'll put your word, those words in your mouth and declare over yourself, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I have remission for my sin, and I shall surely not die. I shall surely not die. I shall surely not die. I want you to speak that over you, but I want to speak it over you as well. Stand on your feet for me just for a second. I want to challenge you moms and dads this morning. When your life changes, let it change your house. Let it change your home. Listen to me. The words that you receive from the Word of God, what goes in your ear gate will change your life. You, can't, you can never unhear something. We have people that we meet with and counsel with and they said this and they said that and I can't forget about them saying this or saying that. I forgave them, but I can't forget it. I just, it just keeps. Every time you see your eye gate and your ear gate are so important. We have to guard our integrity, men. We do. Ladies, guard your honor. Guard your honor. Find yourself faithful to the Word of God. Find yourself faithful and let Him find you faithful. Amen. There's people in here this morning that you have fell subject to the rhetoric and the foolishness of society. Let's just be real. Your faith has been challenged and you dropped the ball. Your faith has been challenged and when that challenge came, you weren't strong enough. And so today, God has given you an option to declare over your life with a simple phrase and just say, Father, forgive me. With a repentant heart, he's there waiting, he's there waiting, he's there waiting. He's been dealing with you since the start of this service. And though we started out talking about the deception of the enemy, I want to tell you about the goodness and the greatness of the Father. That with the simple words, Father, forgive me. And that repentant heart, you become a new creature. And you can declare over yourself, you can declare over yourself, I shall surely not die. I shall surely not die. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we praise you today. Lord, we love you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We love you, God, today that you sent the Holy Spirit to comfort us. Heavenly Father, to build us, to mold us, to give us boldness, to give us confidence, Lord, to walk in you, stand in you, fight in you. But God, we need boldness to live in you, believe in you. That when all hell is broke loose and come against us from the left and the right and from the front and the back, God, we choose to stand today. In the society that we live in and the craziness that we're subject to, I still choose Jesus. I still choose Jesus. I still choose righteousness and holiness above everything else. I choose you today, God. And Lord, I pray for every person in this building that the enemy was want to sneak in and cause confusion, but he's the liar and the father of all lies. And so today, knowing and having the knowledge of the Word of God that you are not the author of confusion, we ask confusion to go in the name of Jesus. We ask doubt to leave in the name of Jesus. God, I praise you today for a loving Father, a loving God that has already wrapped his big daddy arms around this congregation, that has already been loving some ugly out of some people, that's already been loving some things out of some people this morning and God they're ready to submit they're ready to give it up and give in and God as we pray today love on them touch their hearts Lord as David cried many times Lord search my heart God search my heart search my heart as pastor search, search my heart as a man of God search my heart Heavenly Father search my heart and God as you're searching today I'll just be first Lord Forgive me. 
for my shortcomings and my errors in judgment. God, forgive me for my doubt, God. Sometimes, Lord, just forgive me for the things, Lord, that I've stepped outside of your will and got ahead of you, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me of anything, Lord, that I've operated in or done in con that's contrary to your word. God, I love you today, and I choose you. I choose you. I repent this day in Jesus' name. With everybody's eyes closed and your heads bowed, can I ask you something? Would you say today that you were here for a purpose and on purpose, on purpose and for a purpose? That today this message was for you. It was confirmation of everything you've been feeling this week, everything you've been battling, the conviction you've been dealing with, that you would declare today. Today has been your day to turn your heart back to God, to turn your life back to God. If that's you, just slip your hand up. And I'm going to just pray a prayer of agreement. Amen, amen, amen. A prayer of strength. Thank you. Anybody? Yes, hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Praise it. Listen to me. Listen to me. Don't let the devil rob this moment from you. Don't let him steal this moment. Declare right now, Satan, you're a liar. Satan, you're a liar and a deceiver. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Tell him that. Today, I am a new creature. Tell him that. Today, I am a new creature. Christ, I receive you as my Lord. I receive what you did for me at Calvary. I receive what you did for me at the empty tomb. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. In Jesus' name, I'll never be the same. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Give him glory. There was about 10 hands went up. Give him glory. All of heaven is rejoicing this morning because another name has been entered into the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. Would you give me about one minute? I want to challenge some of you parents, and it's in the spanking. Just listen to me. There's so many things offered out there for your kids. And I know you're busy, and I know you're running, but can I share something with you? A parent that spends five hours an evening addicted and tied to their telephone is losing their kid. You're losing your children at a vital age. I'm, listen, I'm telling you, I'm just sharing this with you. Take it or leave it or however you want to do it, but listen to me. As Pastor Tammy and I have sit with the young people and just listen to conversations of the games they're playing on these Xboxes and whatever. Listen, I know none of the names. I'm not into that, but it don't matter. I'm not saying they're wrong or they're bad. Those, those, those controllers will not send you to hell, but listen to me. You are setting your kids up for a fall. I'm listening to stories from these young people, and I'm talking about kids 10 years old. One kid, they were talking about Grand Theft Auto, whatever, number 48. I don't know what number it is. And they were talking about it, and one little boy, and thank God for that boy's parents, he said, he said, listen, it says on the box that I can't play that. My mom and daddy said, I can't play that until I'm 18. And the other kid said, I've been playing that since I was seven years old, and I'm the best at it. And you know where you can steal the car, and then they offer a reward? He said, I steal the car, and they offer a reward, and I go back, and I get that reward off the little old lady that brings it to me on that game, and immediately I turn after I get her money, and I shoot her in the head. Listen to me. Listen to me. These kids are on loan to you. On loan to you. He has given you a gift. Then he has given you the gift of life. And it is your responsibility to speak the gift of life into that gift that God has given you. I saw a game this week. And this is the only reason I'm saying it. Listen, I was grieved this week. Where has our society gone that they have a game now? an interactive game that you're the teenager in this game and you're the teenager in this game and you're going through everything and you're depressed and you're dealing with anxiety and so it allows you to be that teenager that cuts themselves that harms themselves that brings harm to themselves and we teach it we're letting them teach our kids this and ultimately the, the end of the game guess what you get to do you get to be the teenager that commits suicide and you decide how you die Lord help us Lord, help us as a church to rise up against this foolishness. That for $59, you're going to let this into your child's room. And at $59, when they're busy, bullied at school because you haven't been paying attention, for $59, when they begin to think about taking their own life, I have to cry and say, where's mom and dad? That I let them spend two hours a day. Well, I have my kid limited to two hours a day of video games. Okay, two hours a day, that's 14 hours a week, and they get to come to the house of God and get the Word two days a week if you're faithful enough to bring them. 
And so my two hours, our hour, two hours a week to love on them here and to tell them different here is trumped by that 14 hours. I'm not fussing at anybody. Be mindful of what your kids are doing. Be mindful of where your money's going. You can't ask God to bless your finances when you're bringing that into your house. You can't ask God and expect God to bless your finances when you're feeding your child that gift that God has given you. We've got to listen. I'm, listen, Montana will tell you I was never her buddy. I was her daddy. I was her godly daddy. We didn't do that. Be the godly dad. Be the godly mom God's called you to be. Listen to me. I'm not scolding anybody. This is a, this is a, a, a public alert. You may not even know the game's out there. It's out there. It, it comes on the scene either this week or it was last week, but it comes on the scene where you can spend your, they can spend their, uh, I don't even know if people get allowance anymore. They, I, if they do, it's just free money, right? We don't make them do anything. Okay, maybe that was a shot. The other's not. But listen, be mindful of what you're giving your kids, please. And I'm not fussing. I'm talking as a dad. I'm talking as your pastor. When I saw this game, I was so grieved. But time after time, listen, while we've been in church, there's been probably, uh, I can't remember the statistics, while we've been here for an hour, uh, I think there's a suicide about every six minutes. Ten people committed suicide while we've been in here. I don't want it to be your child. Let's be mindful. Let's challenge ourselves to lay these things down in the evenings till the kids go to bed. Listen, anything that can happen on them can wait. Anything. Let's be mindful of what our kids are doing. I'm not saying don't get them games. Listen to me. We were talking to the heart doctor. I was at the heart doctor a while back and talking about technology, and I said something about the kids just want to play games, and he said, man, if they're good at it, they can make a killing. He said, we've got people doing heart surgery three states away running a robot with a remote control we need those gamers to change the world so I'm not knocking that okay I'm not be mindful be mindful of what we're allowing our parents our kids as parents our kids to see amen listen I love you don't take that as a shot he's still on, he's still on the throne however you do it he's still the king of glory however you do it we love you thank you for being here today that was a public service announcement Hey, we love you. God bless you. Give God a hand clap of praise. We'll see you on Wednesday night. Don't forget recovery Monday night at 6. Women of worship, wow, fitness, ladies only on Tuesday night at 630 in the teen center. God bless you.